And the political debate begins with Question Time and David Dimbleby. Tonight we're in Canterbury and welcome to Question Time. And a big welcome to you, whether you're watching, listening, here in the audience, and a big welcome, of course, to our panel. Our panel tonight, the leader of the UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage, the Conservative Communities and Local Government Minister, Penny Mordaunt, Labour's Shadow International Development Secretary, Mary Cray, the Sunday Times columnist and associate editor, Camilla Cavendish, and the comedian and campaigner, Russell Brand. And as you know, with Question Time, you can join in the debate. I have to say my attempt to get people to send postcards to BBC Question Time Glasgow has failed lamentably, so we'll have to revert to the modern media. Our hashtag, BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to us, slightly more old-fashioned way, at, 83, at 83981. You can use the red button to see what others are saying. Anyway, do get involved in the debate as we take our first question, which comes from Jonathan White, please. Jonathan White. Hello. Is the petty adversarial nature of politics causing its own decline? Is the petty adversarial nature of politics causing its own decline? Russell Brand. I think that's a good question, mate. I think to a degree you're, you might be right that it is causing its decline. I'm assuming that that's uh, your opinion. I felt like it was a loaded question but that you felt that the petty adversarial nature, adversarial nature is contributing to its decline and also it's creating the rise of, I suppose, more extremist views. I sometimes think that people in our country feel detached from what takes place in Parliament, that the issues being discussed and the manner in which they're discussed are, are detached from ordinary people. I think we get a bit tired of seeing poor attendances in Parliament for issues that we care about and high attendance when they're talking about their pay rises. So I think that petty adverse or uh, nature that you're referring to is, uh, yeah, I think it is contributing to decline. Okay. Nigel Farage. Well, I would certainly agree uh, with Jonathan's question in the sense that, yes, it's very petty, because uh, we now debate, uh, you know, what colour tie uh, is Ed Miliband or David Cameron wearing, or uh, come up, you know, come up to the election, you know, which hairdresser does their wife go to? And, and it, it's become very petty, and that's because we're not doing real politics anymore. We're not discussing big political issues. You know, 25, 30 years ago, there was a big difference between left and right big fundamental ideological differences you know whether michael foot became prime minister or margaret thatcher became prime minister fundamentally affected the country you know for good or bad depending on your point of view and we've seen the growth of a career professional political class uh, who who do the same degrees and who, who have never had a job in their lives go straight into back offices age 23 and become career politicians. All right. A lack of breadth of experience and no proper ideology in politics. <laughs> does, the, uh, does the cap fit, Mary Cray? Well, I don't think politics is petty, and it's not something that I chose as a career path, as a, as a so-called career politician. I think Nigel fits that bill much better than I do. Oh, please. <laughs> How on, earth, how, how on earth do you get to that? Well, I mean, you've been a member of the European Parliament, you've, you've changed parties, I mean, you, you can argue I spent about... 20 years in business. Did Ed Miliband spend 20 years in business? Not, he didn't spend six weeks in business, did he? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, really? Really? That's the sort of petty political point scoring that I think I, the no, questioner... No, no. <laughs> no, that's fundamental. All right. I think it's important <laughs> that we talk about the big ideas in politics, and there's a big choice facing us at the next general election. I still think politics really matters, and it's really important. We've come through a very big recession, and the question now facing us at the next general election is, who do you want the country to work for? Do you want it to work for a few people at the top, or do you want it to work for everybody in this country so everybody has the chance to get on? And the ideological divide and the choice at the next general election could not be clearer between Labour and the Conservatives. Okay. 
Jonathan White, what do, you what do you make of that answer, that it is still serious business and not petty and adversarial? It's just lost any kind of, any kind of decency. People shout across each other, they're really rude to each other, they make ridiculously stupid points <laughs> and think, think that it's a blame game and everyone's trying to blame everyone else and there's, there's no responsibility and they, the things they say, it, it's like they're treating us as fools. All right, look, look, and the woman up there at the back. Not the woman up there. Yes. Um, I think politics has always been like that. Where I've watched debates and it's always been petty. And I just think that it's going, it is going in the right direction with more women, more people from different types of backgrounds. It just needs to be more like the people. And we are going in the right direction. We just all need to get involved. And it doesn't help when people are told not to vote, in my opinion. <laughs> Are you, are you, Russell, Russell Brown famously said, don't vote. I don't know whether it's still your view, uh, is it? Well, I think the important issue is uh, I, like 70% of the people at the last election uh, the, uh, in this country, didn't vote because we didn't well, feel engaged. Right. Yeah, the European, the European election, the European election, that counts. That's why we got that dude right. at the end of the table. <laughs> Who, by the way, had the perfect training to be a politician because he spent, as he said himself, his time in business in the city, the people that most of us think politicians truly work for. Now, the reason I said that I don't vote... The reason I said that I don't vote is I don't see the interests of ordinary people being represented. My mate Lee Pickett, who works for the Fire Brigade Union, he can't get his voice heard. Old Penny there is presiding over legislation that means that firemen are going to have to work an extra five years. They're really tired from doing the, you know, going into burning buildings and whatnot, so they, they wanted to do another five years of that. This is an agenda that is not met by politicians that, uh, as we understand them. So I suppose it becomes, you know, for fe fellas like Nigel there become more popular. Yeah, but what the, um, what the questener was saying, or what the comment from the back was, that people should vote, and yeah, the mistake is to things. urge people not to vote, as you do. Well, what I say, David, is give us something to vote for. <laughs> right. Penny. Penny, Penny Moore. I, I think that, um, I mean, there's a bit of a, an irony in that um, we say we don't like punch and duty politics, and I think that turns a lot of people off politics. Um, but loads of people tune in to, to PMQs, which is probably the most badly behaved um, time in Parliament. Um, I think that is a bit of a turn off, that kind of punch and duty politics. I think that what people want is serious debate around the issues that they care about. But I also think it's, it's wider than that. I think that. Um, there tends to be a negativity that a lot of people campaign about. They're against things. And actually, what makes people vote is hope. Uh, they, only the optimistic vote. Why else would you trek down the polling station? You only go and vote because you think your vote makes a difference and um, you hope it makes a difference for the better. Um, just an interesting statistic, um, just to pick up your point. Um, the amazing inspirational girl who picked up um, the... Uh, uh, Malala, who picked up the uh, youngest ever recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. She has, uh, on her, her fund, that does amazing work uh, in uh, providing uh, education opportunities for, for girls. Um, she has uh, 117,000 Twitter followers. Russell has 9 million. So, although, um, uh, you know, probably I don't agree with apart from my admiration of firefighters, much that Russell probably... Pay says, their pensions then, love. Well, I'll, we can come Excuse to that. Excuse the sexist language I'm working on that. To that. Um, I no think you have, you have a huge opportunity. And I really You have wish, a huge opportunity. You're a member I, of Parliament. I I'm really a comedian. Wish. You could be in there representing right. well, people. You know, I will I, finish, I one of the things that people really don't like is men talking over women on these types of shows and yes. our voices not being heard. And I apologise. And, 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 and can you let me chair it? Sorry. Come, to, come Sorry. Me in and I'll bring you in up there. I think that's, that's a huge opportunity to get a positive message across. I got into politics from being an aid worker in countries where they didn't enjoy the kind of freedoms we have and they didn't have the opportunities to express uh, their democratic uh, views. And I think that, you know, you have nine million people on Twitter 
And I really wish you'd give people a positive message about voting. I wish you'd give us a about, positive message. It's about, it's about the behaviour in Parliament. It was you who famously slipped into your speech five yeah. times the word which Cop. I... Yes, yeah. Thank Cop you. Thank for you. a laugh with the Navy. And like, the, we're meant to take it seriously. You don't take it seriously and you work there, Penny. How are we supposed to take it seriously? <laughs> well, you have a go. I'm a comedian. I'm a comedian on Twitter. You're a member of Parliament. You're not looking after the fire service. You're not looking after disabled people. I'm on Twitter. Right. I just try my best to help people to okay. campaign. And, and Cam to right. Bet tonight, right. Penny, Cam what's tonight's word? Camilla Cavendish. <laughs> we'll have to wait for tonight's word for a minute. Um, I'm sitting here as a journalist, and it would be very, very easy for me to just criticise politicians. It's a very easy thing to do. I do have two real worries about our politics. One is that I think... A lot of politicians, and quite often the media, I'm afraid, are not interested in detail. So I'm always shocked, actually, to be honest, when I meet some MPs who haven't read the bill that they're <clears throat> voting on. The EU Constitution, which, I, you know, was a brilliant example of that, was a really important thing that was going through the House of Commons. And I would meet people and I'd say, well, have you looked at, you know, Clause X or whatever? They hadn't. Sometimes that is very worrying. The other thing that I think upsets all of us is that there are quite a lot of MPs who haven't run anything and who don't seem to understand the real world and it does worry me sometimes that they therefore don't necessarily understand the what, what their actions are going to lead to and also they're not very good at getting decisions through the machine so in fact you can have I think we do have as Mary said we do have real differences at the moment between left and right actually there are real ideological differences at the next election whether any of those guys will be able to get their policies through to actually make a difference through the machine, I think is a different question. And going, going back to what Jonathan White said, what about the way that politics is actually conducted in the House of Commons, the, the petty adversarial nature of it? We talked about Prime Minister's questions. Do you think that enhances politics? Does I, don't think, make... I, don't think, I don't think any of us can sit here and, and say that it enhances politics. I don't think actually that many people watch it. Thank goodness. I was thinking, what are people thinking? <laughs> you know, there's this, I mean, the last, you know, the autumn statement, there were people mooing in the background. So if anyone from another country comes and watches this, what on earth are they going to think of our okay. politics? The, the, the person up there, the woman in the spectacles on, on the right there. How can you expect young people like myself to engage in politics when there is such behaviour being, being shown and displayed by politicians that, that we see? I, what, what effect does it have on you? It, I, it makes me quite disillusioned, to be honest, and I think to be honest, a lot of people are. A lot of young people don't engage because it just doesn't speak to them. And... N Nigel Farage? Australia is a very healthy, functioning uh, democracy where there's, there's high voter turnout um, and where there are real choices at elections and the way they speak to other in, each other in their parliament uh, is pretty shocking so so I, I you know and the way you speak in the European Parliament oh, is sometimes well, that's quite shocking nothing. isn't it? That's yes. as nothing I mean the European Parliament has been as dull as ditch water I would like to think that some of my helpful friendly advice has <laughs> you know generally gingered the place up a little bit no I mean I you know quite honestly if there are real passions on display and real argument happening, and if that argument is, is at times very heated uh, and, and very, very vocal, I don't think that of itself is a bad thing. OK. The, the man at the back there, in the back row, and then I come to you, sir, two rows down. Yes. Um, just picking up on Nigel Farage's point about real politics, I'm wondering, I uh, understand you're running for the MP for South Thanet, is that correct? Um, I'm just wondering what uh, someone who's worth millions of pounds is planning to do for, to, for one of the most deprived parts of Kent in terms of regenerating Well, sadly... Well, I don't sadly, think it's relevant to ask... Sadly for you, sadly for you, is, I'm not the wealthy one on this panel this evening, all right? Um, I'm really not. Wealthier uh, than the people in Thanet, though. Yeah. Uh, wealthier than some of them, that's certainly <laughs> true. But I'm not, um, I'm not coming into... Um, With great oh, well, respect, we're not, we're not yeah, fighting the general election no, 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 uh, no. in Thanet no, here no, no. just tonight. Whatever you may think, there'll be time for that, no doubt. Racism. In the months oh. ahead. You saw on the right there with spectacles over there. Yeah. Uh, I think it's absolutely true that people have lost respect for politicians because of this punch and judy behaviour, some of which we've seen tonight. But one of the issues here is the nature of the voting system. Uh, when you have the old-fashioned, antiquated voting system, the voices of minorities have absolutely no legitimate outlet. It also, a better proportional system, would force parties to cooperate much further. 
And I think we have to look at this fundamental issue, which should be coming to very important conclusion because of the crisis in the relation with Scotland. How do you distinguish Punch and Judy? You say Punch and Judy here tonight. How do you distinguish that from fierce argument where people actually disagree on important issues? It's this kind of automatically attacking the opponent and not listening to their argument and trying to find some common ground. Yeah. And but you can always predict what everyone's going to say. <laughs> well, can you? I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, let me go to... I'll come over this side here. Yes, I'll come back to you. Yes. It seems to me that the idea of the general good has totally been forgotten. It's not like you're trying to make people's lives better. It's about your own self-interest. And that's what I find difficult. Okay. on his point. I don't... I don't think, um anyone goes into politics and, you know, whatever their views, to, uh, to make life, you know, life worse for people. I think a lot of the p stuff you see in the House of Commons on television, things like PMQs, the Autumn Statement, they are, in a way, pieces of theatre that go on in Parliament. There are debates that happen every day on a whole ra raft of issues, from assisted dying to, to hunting to the NHS, which are fantastic fantastic debates. People who, I, I would just take issue with uh, what was said earlier, there, there, are, there are lots of politicians in there who are career politicians. There are lots of people in there who have had tremendous careers in business, uh, in healthcare, in public service, in the armed forces. We've got, we got 65 veterans in the House of Commons. There are people that have right. done other things before getting right, into Parliament. Okay. A, and they're, a majority of them, even though I disagree with a lot of them, their hearts are in the right place. Okay. A, a couple of quick points. The, the man on the right-hand side in the third row and then the woman below him. Just be brief, if you would, and then I want to go on. Uh, you mentioned the fact that ideologies are going to be really important in the next election and maybe yeah. that we'll actually move apart again. But is the real issue the fact that for the last 25 years or more, every party's becoming so alike that they've got nothing to really argue about in Parliament? So all they do is kind of squabble and bicker and at the end of the day don't achieve much. And that's how you feel it is? Yes. And, and the person below you, the woman below you? I'm wondering if this question can link into the media as well, mm. that they do exactly <coughs> the same thing and they find a personality to pick on rather than worrying about the issues. Wow. All right, Camilla, briefly. <laughs> I think that's partly why I said earlier it's, it's not just politics, it is the media, and the media does sometimes stir it up, and we do focus on sometimes on the trivial and sometimes on the personality, and, and there, are, you know, there are parts of the media that are forensic and they do hold Parliament accountable and they're very important, and there are other parts which perhaps not. I mean, I think just the other point I wanted to make, because I agreed with your first point, but I'm not so sure I agree with your second point, because it is really easy for us from the outside to throw stones. You know, when, when you talk about, you know, Russell, you've talked about politicians that almost as fraudsters sometimes. I mean, you have a really, really low opinion of politicians. And, you know, that's the kind of language that we had in the 30s that led to the rise of fascist parties. You know, it's, it's, it's dangerous. We're in, I feel very depressed by this. I think we're in a very dangerous situation where we are all disillusioned for the reasons that people have put. But there are a lot of decent, I meet a lot of decent MPs who are trying to make a difference. Now, some of them don't manage it for all the reasons that we've talked about. But there are a lot of decent people in there. And they do have the courage to stand for election. You know, they put themselves up there and they stand for election, which I have, I've never done. So I just think we have to be careful that we don't let our, this disillusionment turn into something much right. more nasty. OK. <laughs> um, I'm going to go on... I want, to go, I want to go on to another question. Just before I do, if you want to... I have to announce this now because uh, we, it, we've got a gap after this programme. So if you want to be on the Question Time audience, the, the next two programmes are going to be... One is on the 8th of January in Watford. The other is in Lincoln on whatever seven days after that is, the 15th. And the details are on the screen there, just to mention. Let's go to a question from Lynn O'Donoghue, please. Lynn O'Donoghue. Is Britain really overcrowded? A very simple question. Is Britain really overcrowded? And uh, it, in the light of a report today saying it absolutely wasn't and needed lots more immigration, uh, which came from the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, Nigel Farage. It's interesting. The chap that uh, produced that report today was the same chap who, in 2008, said that the upcoming recession would be minute. So he hasn't got a very good track record. Look, if you fly into Gatwick, uh, you'll see lots of green spaces. That is certainly true. However, if you have a country 
in which the population goes up as a direct result of immigration, uh, what you find is not a shortage of green fields, if that's where you wanted to build houses, you find a shortage of primary school places. You find a shortage of GP surgeries. You know, we have fewer GPs per head than any other country in Europe today. You find congestion, whether it's on the roads or the London Underground or wherever you go. And what you find is that actually you're constantly playing catch up and, and really the general quality of life for the mass of population has gone down. So I think those comments today were wholly irresponsible. And what we've seen, I mean, it's quite interesting to think that, you know, in 1990, the population of this country was 55 million. It is now between 62 and 63 million. That is a massive, massive increase. And I think ordinary folk going about their lives are feeling it. And I, and I, I think, you know, pop, you know Im having a proper immigration policy, controlling the numbers, doing what nearly 200 countries in the world do, namely controlling the numbers that come and the type of people that come, is the answer. Right. Russell Brown. I sometimes feel worried about you, Nigel Farage. Uh, the, the reason I feel worried is because I, I know a lot of people are frightened in our country. I know a lot of people are feeling afraid and frustrated. And there is a sense that there is a corrupt, corrupt group in our country using our resources, taking away our jobs, taking away our housing, not paying taxes, exploiting us. And there is. There is an economic elite that this man's party is funded by, that this man is the back, comes from background working in the city. Let me tell you something. There was an economic crash and a lot of money was lost. His mates in the city farted. Nigel Farage is pointing at immigrants and the disabled and holding his nose. Immigrants are not causing the economic problems and suffering we experience. <laughs> As much as any of us, I enjoy seeing Nigel Farage in a boozer with a pint and a fag laughing off his latest scandals about breastfeeding or whatever. I enjoy it. <laughs> but this man is not a cartoon character. He ain't Del Boy. He ain't Arthur Daly. He is a pound shop Enoch pal, and we've got to watch him. Yeah. Uh, Well, Russell, that's all, um, that's all well and good, and you've got your point of view. The question was, is Britain overcrowded? And, and, and uh, do you think I'm wrong? I mean, do you, I mean, do you, do yes. you not think? Nigel, you, can okay. I not be do more clear, think? mate? I do you think not you're think? wrong. Do I come you not from think? the kind of well, community... This is called question time, this programme, right? And well, happened, tonight you could have and another And what happens is, <laughs> members of the audience ask questions, and we're expected to answer them. You haven't answered this lady's question. Do you think Britain's overcrowded and there is a strain on public resources and people's quality of life? We need more money for public resources. Well, where's it going to come from? It's not overcrowded. It's going to come... Oh, I'm so glad you asked, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Since the financial crash, banker bonuses have exceeded uh. £80 billion. George Osborne, your <laughs> Chancellor, campaigned to stop caps being placed on banker bonuses. At the same time, there all, were austerity cuts against the poorest among us, the disabled, people that we need to be looking after. We need to close tax loopholes, which are exploited by big corporations. There's money. I've got money now. I've seen rich people. There's plenty of money out there. It's just not being distributed. Okay. Yes. And I don't like people preaching that uh, I am any part responsible for anything. I've never heard him criticised as disabled. I never have. OK? Never. No. OK? And you are a campaigner, yeah? I'm going to go back to the last question. Please let me finish. I'm mate. Stand. Stand for Parliament. If you're going to campaign, then stand! OK? OK, you have the media profile for it. Uh, Do it! My problem would be, mate, I'd stand for Parliament, but I'd be scared that I'd become one of them. I, I know what side but of the No, argument. no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You fought addiction. You fought addiction and you've beaten it, OK? You, you can't preach that. 
That is, that is rubbish. Mate, I You cannot preach that. I'm not preaching. What I'm well, you is... are. You've attacked him, OK? Yeah. OK? And you've attacked a... him and you've attacked everybody that stands for his party. I do. They, I do. They... We're trying. I'm sorry. I'm attacking people they are that... people on the street. Oh, are they? Are they? Rubbish. Rubbish. I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, it's the general public that is standing for him. He's a racist scumbag trying to blame immigrants for the car bags because of his rich. All right, Russell, you've got some voters here, mate. You ought to stand. I mean, they're, they're, right. these are your voters. They're, they're lovely people, aren't they? I'm coming for you for our They're lovely you people. Bloody warrior. Right. <laughs> I just hear from a voice up here. The, you sell on the gangway. Uh, behave yourself over yeah. there. The, the point I want to make to Russell is that you, you say you, you claim to sort of stand up for the working classes, but you've got to understand that it's the working classes that have been hit the hardest yeah. by immigration, mass immigration. You know, wage compression, the, ch the, the, the change in communities over, over a short uh, period of time has led to, you know, um, tension within communities. So you've got to appreciate that actually, you know, it's all right to say, you know, criticising UKIP and Nigel Farage, but actually it's the people at the bottom of society that have been hit the hardest yeah. by immigration. I'm telling you, mate, honestly, I come from the same communities you come from. I've been very lucky and I've had a few breaks and I've got a few quid now. And I'm telling you that... Immigra immigration has always been happening. What happened in 2008 was very unique. If I fought... The scale. If I, the scale. My friend, I swear to you, if I thought, listen, try this. For two years, turn your focus to corruption in the city. Turn your focus to apathetic politicians. Turn yourself to the corruption that's going on there. And if in two years' time your life ain't got better, campaigning against the people that have wealth and power, not those that have very little, if it's still the same, I'll come with you and campaign. But I'm telling you, I know where the power is. I know where the money is. I know what we've got to do. Camilla Cavendish. Camilla. Camilla Cavendish. I'm not quite clear, Russell, what the relationship is between the city and immigration. I mean, the city of London actually now has some of the most talented people from all over the world and we should be really proud of that. It's a fantastic meritocratic success story for this country. No, I can I just finish? Can I finish? <laughs> it seems to me, to the gentleman's point here, you know, we're at the end now of, what, 16 years of this experiment in mass immigration that was launched by the Labour government that the British people were never consulted on. And it was an experiment, and we're in the middle of it, and it has brought a lot of people here. And whether or not we're actually overcrowded, to your question, I think a lot of people feel that we are. And I don't think anybody in this country wants to shut the door. I really don't. I don't think anybody in this country... I think there are very few people that you can call racist in this country. I think we are a deeply tolerant country. I yes. think we are yeah. deeply yeah. welcoming to people. Yeah. And a lot of people have come here and they've done brilliantly and they've integrated. But what I do feel is that people want a sense of control. Mm -hmm. They want controlled yeah. immigration. Control and that is what... If we have controlled immigration... It doesn't mean we'd shut the door, it doesn't mean we'd actually let fewer people in, but we would be a country more at ease with ourselves, and I think that's what we need to get to. All right. <laughs> the, the question was about overcrowding, Mary Cray. I'll come to you in a moment. Well, just 10% of the landmass of Britain is actually built on, and what we have at the moment is a housing crisis because there's been a collapse in house building in this country. Um, we have an infrastructure crisis. It isn't because there are too many immigrants on the M4, and I think your comments, Nigel, were deeply uh, irresponsible. Do you know what percentage well, of the South East is built on, as no. opposed to the United Kingdom as a whole? And is that a pertinent question? Yes. Well, I don't know, I don't know don't what know. the percentage no. is, okay. um, but uh, the point is that this government came in, they cut investment in roads, they cut investment in housing, and people talk about primary schools. Um, we have a crisis in primary school places because we have an ideologically driven government that has pursued a free schools programme, opening schools in areas where there is no need and leaving places like my city in Wakefield with uh, a trebling in the number of children that are now taught in classes of over We, we may come to education later. So but the point to... I'm trying to make is that at difficult times um, we need investment in those public services. When we talk about the NHS, we talk about schools, we talk about crowding, uh, uh, overcrowding and how housing, 
We, uh, immigration is sometimes used as a proxy. Now, we've said we got some things wrong on immigration. <laughs> we want to control immigration and we want to control the effects of immigration. But as the daughter of somebody who came here to work from Ireland in the 1960s and who paid his way and contributed to this, this economy, I think that some of the tone of what you say, Nigel, about immigrants and blaming them for all sorts of random problems is not the way our country wants to go. And when we bring people in from outside, companies should, for coming from, bringing people in from outside the EU should be training a young person in our country to take up those jobs. We want to get rid of the agencies that only recruit from Eastern Europe and bring people in to but undercut we, wages. We uh, want to put an end to that wage exploitation. Right. And for people who think there's no point in voting, that's the difference between Labour and the Conservatives at the next election. Mary, Mary, the whole point of this, and, and I'm pleased that you are now apologising, because when the doors opened to eight former communist countries, your government said it would lead to an increase of 13,000 people a year coming into Britain, and it was hundreds We've of thousands a year. We've got things wrong on right, immigration. Okay. But, but those but, immigrants but came here is the worked point. and paid their but taxes. But here is the point. How on earth can you have school provision? housing provision. How can you plan for the future if you have an open door to nearly half a billion people? That is why, that is why in our we need, service, but that is why we need control. Of but, the people in the National Health Service are from overseas. Yes, and what they would can, happen to and the they National can have Health work, Service? But they can have work permits. The point is, are we overcrowded? Do we have too few resources? The job of government is to plan for the future. You cannot plan if you have open door immigration. All right, I want, to back, to I want to go plan. back to that point. <laughs> I tends to go round in circles. I want to go back to the woman up there who was trying to get in before. Up at the back there, yes. I, thought, I, I think we need to cap immigration. Um, we've got Canterbury um, Prison now that is full of um, immigrants from outside UK, and it is, it's full. We should vet uh, people coming into this country. It's not about cutting, stopping people coming into the country. It's about vetting them. We need to know that they have skills set for the yeah. country. There's jobs for them to come in. We shouldn't have to support them when they come over. They should be able to contribute to the country, not segregate themselves. I, am f I fully support people coming over to work to integrate into this country. We have one of the most open door doors, but we need to vet people coming into this country. We don't want people that with criminal histories. We don't want rapists. We don't want murderers. We don't oh, want them. Up. You are lady. You are the rudest woman that I've ever, ever met. Yeah. Don't sit there and be It's nothing, it is nothing at all to do with racism. At all. You need to back off and mind what you say. It's nothing to do with racism. It's about... It's not even about numbers. It's vetting people. We need to make sure that people come into this country, they have a skill set for this right. country. When you say it's not about numbers, then, in reply to the question, is Britain really overcrowded, is your answer yes or no? At my, where I live, yes. All right. Yes. Penny Mordant. Well, the, the theme that we keep coming back to is, is control, and I think that's what is worrying people most. They don't, uh, although we've, uh, we've been able to control and reduce uh, migration that's coming from, from outside the EU, from within the EU, it is more challenging. I think we've got to do a number of things to improve that. Um, we have to have uh, better border controls. I completely understand uh, the point that you raise. We have to remove any negative financial incentives that might be bringing people here um, so that you contribute to the system before you can have social housing or you can access particular benefits, those kind of things. Sorry, that's only being raised now because yeah, somebody yeah. else has got the backbone to actually say something <laughs> about that. I'm not, I, I don't agree, I'm sorry, Nigel, I don't I agree with everything he says, but I do agree with the fact that he's brought up something that a lot of people feel very, very strongly about. It's not necessarily numbers. It's a whole, a whole band of things. All right. Well, you've... you've, you've Sorry. You've, no, it's all right. You've had to say Penny Morton. And I, uh, the, the final point I would make is this is a hugely important issue, and it's a very sensitive issue. Clearly, there are, you know, feelings high in the studio audience tonight. 
and we've got to ensure that we, the debate we're having is a, is a sensible one, it's a grown-up one. We know that immigration is, is a good thing for the country, that most immigrants are net contributors to the UK economy. They are, uh, they are helping this economy uh, get back on its feet again. Um, but what the public want is, is control. I understand how let down people feel uh, historically about that. And we've got to get to grips with it and we've got to demonstrate to people the changes that are being made and the effect that's having on the numbers. But okay. Penny, you also have to make sure that the Home Office is properly resourced so that we give people's background checks before they're granted citizenship, like we've the done, case that we had this evening. We've done, we've done a huge amount. We've got 170,000 to... asylum seekers that have not been, that are just left in limbo and 50,000 of them have, 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 have just disappeared. Well, you don't have the Mary... systems and you're not counting people in and counting them out of the country. Well, that's in, a big problem. That, Labour, sorry, Labour tough on immigrants. That's something, isn't it? <laughs> Never thought I'd say right. that. The, the person up there, I think you've spoken already, that, that, the person there, four in, four, yes, with two hands up. <laughs> one, one way of doing it. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree that immigration is an issue and people are concerned about it, but I, I, I agree with Mary that they're, they're concerned about it because there are so many other issues about housing, the, the NHS, the, the whole area of public expenditure. And that brings you back to what Russell was saying. We, we spend so much time talking about immigration. It's a side issue when you think about what happened in 2008. We have been robbed, and we are still being robbed. The amount of taxation that is not being paid by the very rich is an absolute scandal. Why yes. aren't we talking about that? All right. At which point I want to go on to another question, uh, which is um, relevant to this, perhaps, which is Alexander, Alexander Quinn, please. Alexander Quinn. What role should the private sector play in the future of the NHS? <laughs> what role should the, N the private sector play in the future of the NHS? This is a hotly contested issue, of course, in the next election, one of the ones we were talking about. Mary Cray. Um, I think that we need to repeal the Conservative and Liberal Democrat health uh, bill and we have made that a promise in our election campaign. We do not want to see it opened up. Do you want, do you want no more private involvement in the NHS? What, what the government saying? has done with their... Uh, top-down reorganisation that they promised wouldn't happen before the last election and which happened pretty soon afterwards because everyone was too scared to say that they didn't understand what Andrew Lansley was talking about, um, is that they've opened the NHS, every NHS service up to any willing provider. That means any company from anywhere can come in and run our um, national health <coughs> service. That is a recipe for inefficiency, it's a recipe for cost going up and it's a recipe for privatisation and co-payments, which is the ideological end of this Conservative and Lib Dem coalition Do you, do you want government. to see the private sector playing a part in the NHS or not? The private sector was used by Labour in government to tackle certain problems. Health waiting lists where people were waiting 18 months for cataract operations and going blind. Hip replacements where people were living in um, pain and heart operations where they were dying before they were getting their treatment. We use the private sector to effectively stop the consultants from having large waiting lists and doing it... Pro we, we bought in, in bulk purchasing, using the NHS's... Pop um, purchasing power to tackle those NHS waiting lists and yes there is a place for it but not uh, opening up every single service and of course in some and services running Hinchinbrook Hospital. and in some services like um, sexual health and some mental health services um, the, the voluntary sector is doing a magnificent job in that but it cannot just be um, c come, come one come all. But you were the only people to privatise a hospital? No, that was done after we left government. But, but it was done uh, when a choice was left only between two private providers and the NHS had been excluded. There were three providers that were in the race when we left government. Camilla Cavendish. There were. And that's the thing you can't really avoid. But, I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, I just think if you can't... The reason the Labour government did that was because that particular hospital was failing. It was, it was not giving good care. It was the bottom of all the lists. They had a choice. Were they going to close it or were they going to try and see if there was a better way of doing something? They tended it out. You ended up with three private sector providers, one of which got the contract. The one that got the contract is actually half-owned by the doctors. Um, 
time will tell, but I don't actually necessarily think that's a bad thing if it gets to better care. Can I just come on? This is an issue that people write to me about so much, this question that you've put. What, privatising the NHS? The issue of privatising. Can I just say, um, at the beginning, privatise, this word privatisation, Mary, that you've used, is so misleading. And I think we just have to start with that. Privatisation means selling off. You know, it means actually selling off to the private sector. If we did that, as you said, it would lead, it could lead to the end of the NHS as we know it. It could lead to the end of free healthcare. And the most precious thing about the NHS, it is free at the point of need when we need it. And we have to keep it that way. But that's not happening. I mean, nobody's talking about privatising the NHS. Nobody's talking about selling it off. What is happening because of the bill that you've talked about, is that some of these local commissioning groups, you know, which are run by doctors, are giving contracts to private groups and also to charities like Macmillan Cancer. That is what's happening. That is an experiment. Nobody quite knows where it's going to go. It's an experiment that has no end, and uh, it's an on, experiment on, that is inefficient. Can you let me finish? It may well be. Can you let me finish? I've, as a journalist, spent five years looking at the NHS, going around the NHS, the thing that most has struck me about the NHS as a patient and as a journalist is that it, we have brilliant, excellent care in some parts of the NHS. We have the best care in the world. And in other parts of the NHS, I'm sorry, we have terrible care. And the variability of care is a real problem for all of us. And what we have to do is we have to improve outcomes for patients. All right. Now, I personally don't mind... <laughs> who provides the diagnostic test or who provides a small piece of it. I don't mind if it's Macmillan. I don't necessarily mind if it's the private sector. Now, I don't want Serco, which is, I think, what people think about when they worry about this, and it's totally understandable. I'm not sure I want Serco running something. OK, I just, think we get but the But I point, don't Camilla. think that's what's on the table. All, I just want to say that we just need to be very careful All right. that we don't shut down small attempts to possibly make things better for patients. Okay. It will be about the shareholder in the end. It won't be about the patient. You shouldn't be making profit out of illness. It's as simple as that. Well, I agree with Camilla. There is an entirely false debate going on. Uh, I think Labour have chosen to make the NHS at the absolute centrepiece of their general election campaign. Um, and, and so the word privatisation is bandied about uh, without really meaning anything. I mean, this is something that I've thought about. We've got an ageing population. Uh, the demand for health services is going to go up over the next few years, hugely from where we are now. Uh, I've looked at, you know, what happens in France, what happens in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, they tend to use more insurance-based systems. Um, we as a party have decided that the NHS being free at the point of care is absolutely vital and that actually... The involvement of the private sector that we saw under Labour and continuing now has not thus far been a great success. Take the PFI contracts, the private finance initiatives. New hospitals were built, but rather than going to borrow money, you know, on the gilts market, um, in that horrible city place where they're all crooks and everything, and <laughs> rather than doing that, rather than doing that, what Labour did was to go to really rich people in private equity groups, so we borrowed 50 billion sterling to build new hospitals, which we built, and no question, but the repayments on that are 300 billion sterling. We have outsourced all sorts of contracts like cleaning of hospitals and look at what the results have been. So my answer to the question is, in the short term, rather than outsourcing to the private sector the functions of the National Health Service, why don't we get a grip and run what we have better and do it ourselves and not make so much big cash for private equity? Okay. I, and, and so you, you dropped the idea of insurance policies. No, we had, a, for no we had a debate about the idea. And, and it's quite right that all political parties, before they formulate policies, should have a big open debate and that nothing should be off the table. You should, you, you should debate. But, it, but, and but discuss you're saying everything. it's off the table now as far as you can I'm saying concerned. that we will fight a general election saying we, we, we think that the outsourcing to private firms that we've seen under the last two governments has not delivered good value for money or good patient health care. But you still want free at the point of Absolutely. demand or supply. Absolutely. All right. Russell Brand. I think that, um, like everyone, that the NHS is one of the great 
cornerstones of our culture. I spent some time in America and you charged for health care there and it seems sort of unnatural to receive a bill after you've been bandaged up in an ostentatious manner in an accent. I, I think uh, I, I spoke to some care workers recently in this care workers union. They said since their local health authority had had private engagement, their wages had been cut by 9% and agency workers on minimum wage had been brought in. It's, they said that they couldn't provide the care they needed to patients. So Obviously, I think that profit, as that gentleman says, has, n should, has no business anywhere near health care. I think it should be kept well away from it. I've spent a lot of time in NHS hospitals over the last year. They're doing incredible work, and I think that it's, it's something that we should preserve and fight for. I'm very worried that there are 71 members of Parliament currently that stand to benefit from further privatisation of the NHS, and this is fur makes me feel further disillusioned with our current parliamentary process. Okay. Before, before I got into Parliament, I was a director of Diabetes UK, and we were one of the organisations that would be counted uh, as independent sector who worked with the NHS. We were using public money, NHS money, to help improve NHS services, to develop for people with diabetes what a year of care would look like. So I think that um, there have been... Uh, there have been huge successes from doing this, from allowing public money to be used by other organisations to benefit the NHS. Under Labour, um, numbers of private sector organisations and independent sector organisations was about 5% of the NHS spend. Now it's 6%. So this is not like massive amounts of independent sector organisations running NHS services. The, the other thing I would just add as well is this is, this is wider than care you receive in hospitals, care you receive in the community in GP surgeries. The other role that the private sector um, and other sectors can play in, in improving our, our national health service is in medical research. But uh, we no, want I just want to bring you to the, the political point, uh, <coughs> even though people shout Punch and Judy. Mary Craig was talking about privatising the NHS. Do you see Tory policy as in the way you're describing it, as being, in effect, privatising the NHS? No, I, I agree with Camilla's point, and I think that, again, this is an institution that is incredibly important to us. Um, Ed Miliband spoke the other day about weaponising the National Health Service. I mean, that's, it's just too important to have that kind of debate what about is weaponizing? it. It's, it's, uh, well, it, it is, what is you know, in effect, it's using it <laughs> you as, don't a, know either. Oh. as a political Ed Miliband said something that and actually, she doesn't understand. You these don't issues, understand. well, it's pro that's not, probably not rare. The, this is about an institution that is so important. It's, the, it's continually the top issue that the public care about. And we have to have grown-up conversations about it. All right. It. Can, Can I just, just make back a point about the life sciences? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really Greg. important point. Go on, then. <laughs> <laughs> The NHS is important. How come you've just got an 11% pay rise yeah. when the nurses were awarded 1% and the nurse I spoke to today hasn't even got that? And she hasn't had a pay rise for three years! I completely understand that. I'm, I can't speak for my. No, 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 no. I can't speak for my. I can't speak for my other colleagues in Parliament. But I can tell you, when if if I am an MP in the next Parliament, when a, a pay rise comes in, I will not take it. I will not take it, and I will tell you why. In in politics, we we put ourselves up to uh, to make decisions for people, to to try and get people to change their behaviour, to persuade a business to set up another business to employ more people to take risks we we're there to try and persuade people who maybe haven't been in work to, to go and get into work and we would have i think we would not have credibility doing that if we were to do something okay like that. so, so that's that's not not an answer, yes. he doesn't want to sit there let him i answer. haven't you, you I don't haven't seem satisfied with their answer no, not at all what's one. the problem she hasn't answered it it was a, it, she, i expected her to say it wasn't their decision it was a private it was a a, a pay sector board well that's board. true but it's the my nurses decision had a pay sector board as well and the civil service I'm a civil servant, I haven't had a pay rise. 
OK. Yeah. If we're going to no, talk about... Can we just say one Very briefly, pay? yes. And if we're going to talk about this. pay, yes. I, I want to just amplify what Russell said about care workers. And I don't think it's actually much to do with private anything. It's it, care workers who are doing a really difficult job. They are having to go into people's homes, the homes of strangers they don't know, and deal with what they find, sometimes on a 15-minute contract. And they are, some of them, a lot of them, are not even being paid the minimum no. wage. And if we're going to talk about pay, those are the people yes, who right. really I, need yes, to talk about. Right. No, yes, right. Right. Very, very briefly, Mary. Very briefly, what are going to Very briefly, please. We talked. We talked a lot about abstracts, but in terms of the NHS, more people are waiting longer to see their GPs. More than a million people have waited more than four hours in A&E, which is why we have said we would bring in a mansion tax to create a time to care fund to have more home care workers, 20,000 more nurses and more GPs to tackle those problems and make sure people get the NHS that they deserve. All right. And, and briefly, if you would. The final point, just to finish off our answering the question, the, um, the other important part of improving healthcare is to have more money going into medical research. Um, the, the way to do that is to bring together smart people who might work in academic institutions, who might work in a pharmaceutical company, and who might work in the NHS. Previously, those people have been trying to find those answers independently from each other. What we've been able to do under work we've been doing in life sciences is to bring those people together to share the intellectual property, that they get to the answers faster, and as a consequence of that, more money will be invested in medical okay. research. All right. All right, we're going on to another question. We've only got time for one more question, I think, and this is from Penelope Kimber, please. Penelope Kimber. Would education and social mobility improve if we returned to a system that included grammar schools, as we still have in Kent? Ah, yes. Kent has, I think, 23 or so grammar schools, a quarter of the schools, of secondary schools are grammar schools. And there is, should, would education and social mobility improve? That's the key point. Social mobility and education improve under grammar schools. Um, Russell Brown, you start on this one. Education, health, a living wage, these things are all rights. These are not things that we should be squabbling over. Uh, I think that grammar schools, I don't know much about it, I went to a comprehensive, I've got a relatively good education. In the realm of education, I'm deeply concerned about students' tuition fees. The privatisation of education seems to me a, a, another shameful slur on our great nation. The grammar school thing, for me, well, I worry with the UKIP scenario. There's a stagnancy in politics today. People don't seem to have very good ideas. But uh, Nigel Farage and UKIP are not the future. It is a nostalgia act. He don't have no good ideas. Grammar schools, no grammar schools. Proper education for all people, whether they're at comprehensives or at universities. And it should certainly be free, not 40 grand a year like he paid. Yes. Uh, Nigel, Nigel Farage? I think the answer to the question is a big yes. A very big yes, indeed. Social mobility in this country has declined. The 7% of people whose parents are rich enough to send them to the private schools are now dominating the media, uh, business, uh, even over half our gold medal winners in the Olympics went to those 7% of schools. And it's like, you know, we've gone back 50 years in terms of the class structure of who is running Britain. I have no doubt in my mind that one of the biggest social mistakes we've made in the last 50 years is the wanton destruction of hundreds of superb grammar schools up and down this country. And to see the Ofsted report yesterday saying that two-thirds of our brightest young men and women are not achieving their best at school in the comprehensive system says to me we are wasting the talent of tens of thousands of our best and mm. brightest people every year. And that is a tragedy for this country. In Kent, in Kent people are fortunate. There is the opportunity of grammar schools, although when we tried through a petition to extend a new grammar school in Seven Oaks, sadly, uh, the, the, the government vetoed but, but, uh, but, it. But, but I think mm, that opportunity... Well, they're now but, but saying, Nigel, Nigel, the Ofsted yeah. chief inspector, Wilshaw, yeah. said last year that grammar schools are, I use his words, stuffed full of middle-class kids. Well, that's in other words, it's not a... Well, 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 why well, did he say well, that? Well, that's because, that's because there are so few grammar schools in this country that actually people move to catchment areas 
areas that have got grammar schools, forcing up the house prices, oh. making it middle class. If every town in this country had a grammar school, it would not be a class or house price issue, and that opportunity would be available to everybody in this country. Okay. You... It would be one of the best things we could do. You in the middle at the back. Yeah, thank you. Up there at the very back in the middle. You've had your hand up some time. Yes. Sorry, I'd just like to say that I went from a Catholic school to uh, the grammar school here in Canterbury. And for anyone on the panel that thinks that grammar schools shouldn't be, you know, mandatory is, is just ridiculous. And I can tell you the difference is, is people succeed better when they're at a grammar school. OK. And the, and the woman up there on the right, in white. And then I come back to the panel. Yes, you, madam. Yes? No, 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 you're not a, you're a woman, you're a man. The woman in white. <laughs> at least you sound like a man. The woman in white there. Hi, um, I went to a grammar school, um, came from uh, a council estate in the Midlands and went to a grammar school in Kent and I did terribly and I was bullied horrendously because it was full of middle class people. I moved to a comprehensive school and I succeeded and now I'm earning more, mo more money than most people I went to grammar school with. OK, Penny Morton, what's your view about what the policy should be? Well, when people call for more grammar schools, no one is calling for more secondary moderns. And I think, obviously, people who've been to grammar schools and had a, a good experience, I can understand why people like them. But I think what people want is more good schools. And actually, it doesn't matter, you know, I'm not interested in the dogma of whether they're academies or they're grammar schools that can expand or or any of that. Or, what but you're against what Nigel Farage is saying, which is new grammar schools, we, we are a not, grammar school in every town. No, the Tories are against that. We're not uh, setting up any more grammar schools, but, but well, they, can, they can expand. Well, well, but why, we sorry, are, I don't want to stop you in your tracks, but why can they expand, but you don't want any new ones? I don't get the logic. Well, we're, uh, we have other models of uh, setting up new schools. But why do you let um, the grammar schools get bigger, then, if you think that they're not the right model? Because I think that there is a lot to be said. I think a good school um, isn't something that just can be uh, established overnight. Schools uh, improve, you have traditions, you have... Uh, you know, I think if you've got a good school that's set up, you should, you should allow it to take more uh, children in. Okay. But we have... Uh, through uh, academies, through free schools, through a whole raft of means, uh, improved uh, the, uh, the choices that parents have to send their kids to a good school. All right. The let Mary Craig stop you and let Mary Craig. There was an Ofsted report. Of, yes, well, there was an Ofsted that report. Said a million yesterday. children uh, are in uh, a school now. A million more children are in a school now that is good or outstanding. And said that 70,000 more children are now in a school that is inadequate and that is because you have presided, Michael Gove in particular, presided over allowing unqualified teachers into the classroom. What we want to see is a world-class teacher in every classroom. I'm not a fan of grammar schools. There's 164 left in the country. Nigel talks about them being destroyed. They weren't destroyed, Nigel. They were converted into comprehensive schools. And I went to a, a former converted grammar school that converted into a comprehensive school. I got a good education there. Lots of people I went um, to school with didn't. But I want every child to have the best education that money doesn't buy. A world-class school in every neighbourhood right. with world-class teachers, great governors, great leaders. And well, that is how we change. The country. All right. uh, Cam the Camilla Cavendish, sorry, Nigel, I've got yeah, to stop you because we're coming to the end of the programme. Camilla, briefly, if you would. In the 1960s and 1970s, we had much more social mobility in this country. We had a lot of people who went to Oxbridge universities from grammar schools. And we now have this dominance of private school children at Oxbridge and all, all the way through that we all know about. Um, unfortunately, I think what has happened is that a lot of the grammar schools that are left have become very middle class and they're not necessarily serving, as you just said, you know, they're not serving people from your background. And that's unfortunate. I'm not, I'm not sure the answer is to go back to grammars. It just seems to me the answer is to use the three things that grammars had. One of them was that they had autonomy. They made their own decisions. One of them was that they enforced discipline really successfully. And the other one was that I think in the 1960s and 70s, teachers had much higher status, you know, than they do now. Our time's up, and I, I get ticked off if I go on over an hour. I don't know why with such a good panel, but anyway. Um, yeah, we're going to be back. We're not back till after Christmas. We're going to be in Watford on January the 8th. Uh, we've got uh, Jimmy Wales, the man who created Wikipedia, uh, on the panel then, and Vince Cable for the Liberal Democrats. The week after that, we're going to be in Lincoln. So if you'd like to come uh, and join our audience and take part in the debate, Either programme, Watford or Lincoln, 
you apply the usual way the words of the uh, website are on the screen there now or you can call us on 0330123 if you've been listening on five live or indeed are listening on five live the debate goes on on question time extra time but meantime my thanks to our panel here to our audience who came here to canterbury and from all of us who work on question time through the year a very happy christmas see you again in the new year good night More discussion of the past seven days of politics on this week. Next. There's always a story of pain. If you were able to process the pain, the drugs would not be necessary. Can a reformed addict get under the skin of Britain's war on drugs? Do you ever feel that it's pointless? Well, we're trying to break the cycle. And if we don't...